chapter nine is sort of a pause. Um, we've gone through the basics um, and then a little more in depth on environmental economics. We've looked at how we can apply traditional economic theory to economic, to environmental um, issues uh, like um, externalities, public goods, common resource goods, things like that, and how policy sort of works around that. And chapter nine then takes some time to look more at ecological economics. Um, and uh, I'm glad this is here because a lot of the folks who are interested in taking a class like environmental economics um, are scientists or ecologists even. Um, and, and this chapter is here for you guys uh, to bring those other perspectives into what we've been looking at. Um, so if you'll remember from the first chapter or so, uh, we introduced the ideas of uh, economics or uh, environmental economics versus ecological economics. And we looked at um, the circular flow diagram for a traditional economic system. Um, and then we added to that more of the ecosystem, right? Um, and so this, this chapter starts with that discussion that... Uh, We've got our, as you see in this picture, we've got our economic subsystem is that white box there. And that would be that traditional um, uh, flow of goods and resources um, from uh, resources from households to firms and then goods and services from firms back to households and things like that that we traditionally see in an economic system. Um, and then ecological ec or ecological economics uh just recognizes that that economic system is within a larger system that um, also into a an economic system we don't just have the traditionally thought of economic inputs of labor and human created capital we also have environmental capital we also have energy and environmental resources that flow into that system and without which the economic system would not work. Um, and then the economic system, uh, though we traditionally think of it as being a closed system, a closed loop of resources and goods and services, um, that's not necessarily true either. If we think on a larger scale, that system also has outputs of energy and waste and sometimes some recycled matter that can go back into the system. Um, but so if we think about the global ecosystem, there's really only one input, that's solar energy, and one output, which is waste heat. Um, and, and everything else is, is part of that system of what goes in and comes out of the economic uh, engine or economic system. And so what happens as that economic subsystem grows is we get to this picture where the economic system is sort of taking over the global ecosystem. And we're reaching the limits of what the global ecosystem can sustain. Um, and so now we have to think about uh, how to measure what the ecosystem actually can sustain versus what we're using. And um, then also, what to do about the fact that we're maybe butting up against those limits of what the what our ecosystem um, can sustain. Um, so this is just based on a particular study in 2009. Um, they took uh, several smaller uh, systems um, or, or smaller uh, measures on which we can measure the boundaries of our planet, of our ecosystem, um, climate change, ocean, acidification, uh, things like that. Um, you can see them there. And the, the shaded area here, this inner circle, the light blue shaded area, shows what really is the sort of sustainable area. That's how much use these different uh, uh, systems can sustain, um, how much acidification the ocean can take before it starts to uh, break down, in other words. Um, and then the, uh, the darker blue cones 
are showing the, the current as of this study levels of use in each of those. And so you can see that we are in um, climate change, biodiversity loss, and nitrogen cycle. We are outside those boundaries um, of, of what is, uh, according to this study, sustainable. Another way to look at how much we are using um, the larger ecosystem is, is to think about an ecological footprint. So um, this, this looks at uh, how much land does each person take up. So the per capita ecological footprint means per person ecological footprint. How much land does it take to sustain an individual's lifestyle? Um, so some of that is pretty simple. If you think about uh, um, the our demand for meat, you can just directly uh, draw from farming and cattle ranching how much land it takes to sustain a cow, and that's how much it takes to provide a cow for our demand for meat, that sort of thing. Um, our demand for corn very sort of easily translates into how much land it takes to grow that amount of corn. Um, but then there are other things like carbon emissions that we that are measured here in an ecological footprint uh, based on the amount of vegetation or amount of land it would take to sustain enough vegetation to absorb the carbon that we are emitting. So things like that. Wait, ways that we can measure how much land it truly takes to sustain what our um, standard of living, our lifestyle, or our consumption. Um, and what you see in this graph is, based on a 2016 study, for each of these countries listed, um, the blue bar is the available land in that, in that uh, country per person, so per capita available land, and the black bar is the per person ecological footprint how much land it takes to sustain a person in that country. Um, and you can see that for almost every country listed here, there, there, there are a few, three, I think, that stand out where the blue line is longer than the black line. But for almost every country listed here, we're using more land than we have. Here's another picture of that ecological footprint. Um, the global footprint, this isn't broken down by uh, country, but here it's broken down by um, impact type or the type of uh, the way that we're using um, the land. And so you can see, uh, and, and by year across the bottom, so you can see that around 1970 or so is when our total um, ecological footprint became greater than one earth, right? So on the, on the vertical axis, what you see is the percent of the total available land on earth that we're using. Um, and so we crossed over that one 100% uh, mark around 1970, and it's only grown up to, up to the last year that's listed here of 2012. Um, we are using far more land uh, or need far more land to sustain our lifestyles than is available on Earth. So, so the book then trans, uh, goes into um, what we can sort of do about some of those things. Dif uh, this chapter contains a lot of vocabulary that I'm, I'm not going to go through because you can read those things. Um, and then some of our policy choices on and, and how to um, sort of try to bring this ecological larger um, picture, big picture thinking into our economic systems and into our economic policy. 